We got the exclusive, 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 Stacy. I am Stacey Robertson, your host with the most exclusive and one of Atlanta's greatest ideas. All right, welcome back. Welcome back to the exclusive. I am your host, Stacey Robertson, your host with the most exclusive and one of Atlanta's greatest ideas. So I hope you all have been enjoying the show thus far. I tried to give you all the most swiftest intro that I possibly can, all right? So I hope you all were able to gather all the information. So with us in the studio, all right, we have none other than Stefan for you, party crew. If you anywhere, make some noise. Hey! So Stefan. Larry Savage in the building. Welcome to the show. What's up, what's up? All right, now you know I got to get a, a, a quick bio on you so just so everyone would know who we got it in the studio with us. So Stefan began his career with Disney as a main performer on the popular Disney Channel Rock. He released several singles over the past few years. He is currently signed to rapper young ra rapper actor Young Jock and he's been doing his thing every since. So again, welcome to the show. Hey, you know, actually I appreciate everything you just said. But and you know, and like people they always kind of oh, go yeah. to the Diddy card first. So I'm glad you didn't even do that. Like, that was lit. I don't appreciate that. We're going to talk Diddy, all right? So we still talk you know, Diddy. We no, I appreciate talk. we didn't go Diddy first. No, no, no. Look, there's always a, look, there's <laughs> always a method here on this, to this. Yeah, so, but do I did want yeah. to share with you. Um, definitely thank you for being a part of the show. And you are what now, when anyone that does the show, you're now considered friends of the show and your friends of the university, all right? Appreciate it, appreciate it. Happy all to be right. here, man. Hey, we, we definitely have you. So we're just going to jump right in. And I just want to start, because I want anybody to get a chance to know you. What are three words that describe Stefan for you and why? Lavish, savage, <laughs> <laughs> and reckless. And reckless, um, okay. Yeah, so people actually, like, they call, like, that's my nickname. They call me the Lavish Savage. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, I have a, a R&B vibe to me that's like, Gentlemanish, mm -hmm. you know, pretty boy is vibe, but I'm really out of control. I kind of promote myself as like that, that alter ego as a out of control party person. Mm -hmm. You know, I just do whatever feels right, whatever's fun. I just don't care about tomorrow because okay. it's about today. We live for today every day. There you go. So it's like you know, and, and it's part, it's partially because of what came from my acting, mm -hmm. people that I played that even instilled that thought process in my head. Like okay. you know, like they they call me like he like he lived like a little ditty. Okay. Like, yeah, we live like that. Like you know, that that's important. <laughs> right. Gotcha. 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 Well, hey, you know what? I'm here for that. All right. Um, let me ask you this. So, where are you from, and how did you come up with the name Stefan for you? So I'm from DC, Orlando. It's a small island somewhere, and I'm joking. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm from DC, born and raised. But I I felt I grew in Orlando. Okay. It's like because in, in DC, you know, being in the hood areas, I was that kid that my parents wouldn't let out the house. Mm -hmm. So I, I I was in the hood, but not in the hood. If that right, makes right, any right. logical sense. But then, like you know, in my teens, I got to Disney, and you know, there's no parents at that point. But you become whoever your Disney's gonna. Mm -hmm. See who you're gonna become. Mm -hmm. So I claim Orlando so heavy because I spent a bulk of my years becoming who I was gonna be mm -hmm. in Orlando. So Orlando's home just as much as DC is home, but DC is more family. Orlando's more where where are your friends and everybody. Like Orlando's home. Mm -hmm. And I like how you have to shout out both. All right, absolutely. We, we all have our origin somewhere, and that's very important that everybody know, you know, where you where you represent. So yeah, definitely. So how did you come up with Step Up for you? Uh, Twitter. Okay. You know, y'all got a problem when Twitter like was popping at one point. I just don't call you nothing but the names mm -hmm. that you name yourself on Twitter. So like you know, I'm giving DJs records and stuff, and they're not saying Stefan. They're saying Steph Stefan for you. The only thing they're not gotcha. saying is the at. Gotcha. So I kind of just ran with them like Stefan for you. Uh, Soldier Boy, tell them. I guess let's just run with it. You okay, know? So, I like it. I was I like, like it. Let's just keep it. So I just kept it. Now you know. It's been a few years, because we go, we actually go back a little bit, right? Yeah. And so, I actually met you when I was very instrumental, being a part of a team that helped brought the OMG girls to my hometown. Texas, shout out to Texarkana, Texas. Shout out Zonique, and Mr. Holmes. And you were actually one of the opening acts for I the was, OMG. I was, and I didn't even know Zonique back then. That's the funny <laughs> part. <laughs> and so, it's funny, that's how we actually met. And I know we kind of got um, uh, lost contact, you know, a little bit over the years, but... 
the power of social media will definitely bring you back in front of people. So I'm just glad to be able to be reconnected to you and, and actually see the growth in your career and see all the great things that's going um, that's happening for you. So how did you end up on Disney? Um, Disney does an audition once a year, mm -hmm. and you kind of just got to know when it pops up and just go. Mm -hmm. And that kind of that's kind of how it happened for me. Like I showed up, and um, like I said in DC, I wasn't much of anything. I was the guy that everybody made fun of. I was real short, skinny, real too goofy. But those are all the qualities, honestly, that worked for Disney. Like everything that was my, my hindrance in DC was my strength when it came to doing a Disney audition. The little short, skinny black guy <laughs> that's real goofy. That's right. actually, that works for us. Let's, let's run that. So, I mean, that's it was real simple. You show up to the audition, but you got kids that audition all their life. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's intimidating. You, know, you show up and they like, mm -hmm. they're reading the scripts like, yeah, I got this. And they're like asking you, so what other things have you acted on? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you know, like, like, right. I ain't acting on nothing, man. Like, you saw, I'm, I'm from, I'm from D.C. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after a while, you know, you get that role and it's like, Dang, I, I, I was urban white enough to make it. Like, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah. People audition all their life. And that's I was right. like, first audition out the gate. Like, you got it. Like, you here. Like, all right, cool. So that speaks to the nature of who you are. That means you really, really just that dope, right? I was just not caring. Like, right. that's, that's always the key to my success for anything I do. I don't care. Like, like Jock is always, he promotes. Like, Stefan has no fear. And that's mm -hmm. why he always succeeds. Mm -hmm. Like, I just rock. I walk in. Let me read the, the script. I make jokes in between. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not walking in there just reading the script and walking out. I'm, I'm going to give you a comedy special. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like, that's that's important to anything you do, just to not have a fear level. I'm just going in there. What's up? What's up, y'all? I don't know if I'm going to get it. What's good? Y'all good? Like, who's this dude? Like, right. <laughs> you know? and, that, and, that, and that's what takes you a long way. That's good. So, that's, um, let me ask you this. So, let's talk about the music industry. How hard was it actually breaking into the music industry? Um, Orlando was hard mm -hmm. because after Disney, I mean, let's just be honest, after Disney, you always see uh, people go kind of wild or um, they you just don't hear from them anymore, especially black individuals mm -hmm. specifically, you know. Um, so for me, it was really hard because I was already deemed as Disney, you okay. know, so it's like the music I enjoy making ain't Disney. So when Disney's over and I'm making the music I actually right. genuinely like making, it's hard to really um, get attention. So I, I, I got attention through my shows because I figured, I'm like, all right, look, outside from this Disney stuff, who do you look up to? I was like, Usher, Bobby Brown. Like, so let's give the quality of shows that make people pay attention to you mm -hmm. and not think about anything else but that show. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was my way to say, you're going to pay attention to me. I mean, like how we met on the show. Like, I mean, I'm, I put comedy on anything. I think the first time we met, uh, I fell. In a, in a bleacher, I, I remember school. that. I was like, like, I fell right. mid show in the bleachers, right? And I forgot what I said, but I was just like laying, like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> like you know, you like, I don't care. Right back up, though. No, no, I got, I got to share that. So, uh, some of the acts were able to go to a local middle school and uh, perform for the student body, and actually, um, Stefan was performing. I mean, when I say was killing it, and he fell, but he got right back up, like. He, like he did not fall, and, it, and that just shows the level of maturity, just the level where you are as a performer. And so, like, nobody even really paid attention. Yeah, I think I told yeah. the girl I fell for her. Yeah. And I was like, I was on the ground like, yeah, I just, yeah, I just exactly. fell for you, man. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Wow. That's what's up. So, um, so we, we're going to talk about it a little bit, and we may get caught up in timing, but I do want to go ahead and introduce this next thing. So how did you get signed to Young Jock? And there may be a time I may have to stop you, and we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to finish up, and I'll let you know. I so see, so how, how did we get signed to It's the Young weirdest Jock? story ever. Actually, you're going to say, you're going to say, what? I met Jock through Nelly. Oh, wow. Right? Like, how do you know Nelly? Yeah, like, exactly. It goes back to, like, <laughs> so Nelly used to come to Orlando a lot and do shows at the, uh, Mardi Gras, mm -hmm. and um, I was in a boy band at the time, and I was always trying to push to try to, you know, Nelly was signing people, so I used to be, like, at, at the hotel lobby, like, trying to get my demo and everything like that, but his people saw the hustle, so they was cool with me, so they gave me their info, and I always just kept that relationship, mm -hmm. and then when I moved to Atlanta, Nelly came to town, and his people was like, yo, come on out, and I started chilling with Nelly more and more, and um, at the time, I threw Teddy, Teddy Riley and Ray Lavender, a record I produced for them that they put Jock on. When I saw Jock backstage at the concert, it was uh, me, Nelly, Tip, uh, Jermaine Dupri, all of us. And um, I saw Jock. I'm like, I'm about to walk up to Jock because I know he's on the song that I produce and right. I'm featured on. 
So John was like, I was wondering who made that. And then we exchanged numbers. And the next day I hit him up. I sent him some music. So it's like, all right, now he's legit. John was like, start coming out with me. We just started going out, literally. Me and John was just like, let's just go out. We all going out. Mm-hmm. I got this party here. I got to do this. Come on out with us. And um, the more we went along, John hearing music, it was real late. And he was like, you know, you just kind of should start letting me manage you. Mm-hmm. He's like, you, he's like, Atlanta's all about who you know in Atlanta, mm-hmm. not how good. You know, he's like, you know, so you kind of need that to get in this city. So let me manage you. And that's how I was like, all right, let's go with it. And that's that was the beginning of, of me and Jock brotherhood. Like we became brothers through that. Okay. Wow. Well, we're gonna actually we're gonna dig in a little bit more. Um, about that in a few minutes as well. So we're going to take a quick break. Um, and if you would take us out again, you're listening to Exclusive with Stacey Robinson on WSTU Radio. All right, welcome back to the Exclusive. I'm your host, Stacey Robinson, your host with the most exclusive and one of Atlanta's greatest ideas. So we have in the studio none other than my homie, Stefan, for you. Stefan, where you at? Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wherever the check take me. You hear me. I hear you. I hear you. Well, again, welcome um, to the exclusive. We're going to have a good time. So we were already talking about Young Jock and you getting signed with Young Jock. So now I want to talk about how has the experience been working with Young Jock? You know, the funny part about management, a lot of artists need to realize this. No matter how um, known and notarized your, art, your, your management is, there are going to be uh, uphill climbs, you know, and... Uh, the thing is, Young Jock is such a um, polarizing figure. Or whether it's loving hip hop, he has multiple businesses. He has, like, he owns clubs, he owns salons. You know, it's like, so trying to always demand that level of attention is difficult sometimes. But he's always been a solid person for me. He's he's taught me how to become my own businessman. That's something a lot of management doesn't do for artists. Um, he would tell me, "This is what you really need to do," and open up. He should get your face around. He tells you what to do. It's kind of like, you know, teaching you how to fish more than just giving you the fish. So that's that's the thing that, and, and don't get it twisted. I'm, I mean, as an artist, that's very frustrating because we want things handed to us as artists. We want we want the cake. Just give it to us. We want to be on. Give it to us. But Jock ain't that person. Jock going to open up this door. You're going to set your opportunity, and it's up to you to walk through it and make it your opportunity from there. That's good. So, I mean, it's been a lot of ups and frustrating moments that, Eventually, I came out on top like, dang, he that's what he was doing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so he's always helped me. You know, I'm doing my own tour and everything, and, you know, I, I became a face in these clubs and everything because of Jock. Everything that it comes to why you even know me in the city, mm-hmm. a lot of it is because of Jock. Had it not been for the movie, it's just Jock. Like, all right, he helped erase just looking at me as one platform. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, Jock definitely want to... Um Give a good shout. I've only heard good things about him in, in, as it relates to um, how he treats his artists. I know um, a friend of mine uh, actually did a song with him back in um, a few years back, a female by the name of Sasha Gomez. Right. And so um, definitely I've only heard great things in, in relation to him. All right, so let's talk Diddy, all right? Yeah, so we're going to go from Young Jock to Diddy. Now, it was I, bad boy, <laughs> baby. We're here right now. You know, I got some Ciroc in the bill. <laughs> Now, I recently saw on a YouTube an interview that you did, all right? Yeah. And you played the role of Young Diddy in the Tupac movie, All Eyes on Me. Anybody seen All Eyes on Me? Of course. Yeah. That's him, all right? So you actually played Diddy. Yeah, less so, hair, less facial hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, two, well, and I actually open. saw, number two, it was funny because I saw the movie <laughs> twice. I went to the theater and saw it twice. And not even knowing the whole time, it's you. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the, it's the way they, they you know, you gotta think like, like I said, short hair, yeah, less facial hair, yeah, and then they put you in those baggy outfits, and then you in there with the toothpick, and you just got your mouth open like most of the time, like that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go think but, about me. But let, let's take this further. Though. But to my understanding, you landed the road on accident. Oh yeah, yeah. So how did that happen? That's yeah, what I, we want to talk I about. I showed up. I was making fun of the dude that was Diddy. <laughs> I showed up. I was an extra for like a death row East Coast scene. I showed uh-huh. up. And I saw this dude in the below outfit, like, that's your Diddy. And I'm, like, in there Diddy bopping in the trailer, like, making people laugh. Like, right. yeah, it's bad boy, man. We here right now. Hey, come in. Come on. Let's go. I'm, like, doing that. Like, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just making everybody laugh. This dude pulled me aside. I'm thinking of being fired or something. Bro. He's yeah. sitting home. He's like, hey, man, just sit up here. Next thing you know, I'm standing in front of LT, the uh, executive producer, and wow. Benny Boom. They're like, yeah, this is your Diddy right here. But look at this guy right here. And then, like, we're right beside each other. Dude probably want to kill me right now. Right. And I'm like, hey, man, I don't even know what's going on, bro. Don't even look at me like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
Like, look, he's trying to secure the bag, and you messing up the bag. Go man. Ahead. Next thing you know, they're taking pictures, and then they leave us. I'm talking about, like, yeah, we be back. They leave me and the guy that's currently Diddy in a room alone. And wow. we just sitting there. It's quiet. <laughs> we looking at each other like, <laughs> dude, like, yeah, man, you know. I'm a real, I'm a Tupac fan anyway. <laughs> I'm like, nah, you mad, G? But it's all good. <laughs> Eventually, I mean, it just it just happened, man. I mean, that that's wow. right place, right time. There you go. Wow. And trust me when I say that movie did very, 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 very well. Wow. It landed oh. me Diddy again. You know, I ended up being Diddy again on the Oxygen Network uh, for the Snap Tupac episode. Wow, yeah, man. Was... So, and that just goes to show what it means to be yourself. Yeah. At all, all the time, because you never know. And which I always tell people, also, you know, be willing to do a free performance, because you never know who's sitting in the audience. Seriously, yeah, like I mean, no, right. like you can't be afraid to take that jump. Like you that's gotta right. think. I showed up as an extra, and I ended up leaving as Diddy, and I'm on set, and they, I, they, I forgot my name, because that's all they call me. It's like you know, and I'm even answering like this dude at this point, you know, like Benny's like, hey yo, pup, I'm like, hey yo. <laughs> like you literally got yeah, like I forgot. Right? Like they doing breaks and Bad Boy didn't hang with Death Row. That was real. Like Tupac and them ain't hang with me and Big. Like that when they I'm talking about the breaks. It was real. Wow. We was chilling on on the breaks in our own Bad Boy crew. Like, wow. <laughs> like, like it was real. <laughs> wow. So all right. So I saw on social media that you're gonna be going on a. Bay tour very soon, so let's yeah. talk about it. And then also, I'm sure your lady fans out here want to know: Do you got a bay? <laughs> well, the bay tour is because of the bay album. Okay, right let's now. talk. It. I did an EP called Bay after I got dumped. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer one. I got dumped, y'all, and then I, uh, I wrote an album called Bay, but I wrote it like a BT movie, so I didn't want to make it straight evil. You know, you start real bad, and then like, let's start from the beginning, right. and then you show the good side. You know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> look, you know, I wrote an EP like that. But then I, like, it did so well that people started reaching out, and I made a full album, a deluxe edition. You know, my boy's pretty Ricky, very lavender, and Jock was like, I got to get on the record and all. Uh, so I did a deluxe edition, so I'm like, all right, we got the deluxe edition out. Let's go on the road now. And um, it was good timing, because the Millennium Tour going on right yeah, now, exactly. pretty Ricky doing that thing. I got my mm -hmm. record with them. And, and so, yeah, we going on the Bay Tour. There's no current Bay, though, but that okay. album is about that Bay that... that did that. Well, I'm sure as you go to the to city to city during this tour, you will acquire many prospects for Bay. <laughs> all right. So I'm sure many will be putting I'm in the microphone. I'm, I'm currently taking applications. <laughs> <laughs> or um, will be working with, or would like to work with. Let's talk about. I don't know. Well, I mean, Ray Lavender. That's the guy. Yeah, my girl got a like girlfriend. Ray. You know, yeah. I used to have a with T Pain and all yeah. that. That's my brother. Ray. So, okay. um, Pretty Ricky, that's always been my brothers. Like their last single, Puddles, when they got back together with Pleasure, I co wrote that. Oh, cool. Um, so, of course, they hopped on the album, and it's all love with Pretty Ricky. That's what's up. I'm gonna hang around Jock a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, me and Scrappy talk about doing a record a lot, so okay. hopefully that happens soon. And, and Sammy, too. Me and Sammy always like, we're gonna get together. <laughs> Eventually, we're gonna get together. We just see each other, and it's always right. in a party atmosphere. So it's like, you know, we, we lit. So it's like, like we're gonna, we gonna get together. Yeah, 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 you know. Um, um, if I say who I want to work with, I get a lot of Ty Dolla Signs comparisons sometimes. Okay. So I kind of want to do a record with him. Okay. You know, because I think he's a genius in itself. So yeah, yeah. even if you compare me a little bit to him, because we so savage on what we say out of our mouth, I want to. I would like to do that. Like that'd be a fun record for me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I I met Ty a long time ago when he was just hanging around YG. Mm -hmm. So I mean, to see where he is now, I think that's the person I really want to work with. Okay. So Ty Dolla, if you're listening, please make sure. I want you to get on this record with my boy Stefan for you, all right? And um, yeah, that's gonna be hot. That's gonna be that's hot. Gonna be real hot. And you make sure you let me know when it happened, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and know that that happened from the exclusive. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So you are a young man. What are your thoughts on education in 2019? How important do you think it is, and why, as a community, should we push the effort? It's important, uh, but I think it's important also to not let um, the side voice deter you from what you want to do mm -hmm. like your education there's so many things you can do you can literally go to school for anything anything you want to go to school for but a lot of people go to school and pick up majors and things like that for something that they honestly don't want to do when there's other majors that they want to do mm -hmm. um, so my thing is education is vital but you don't want to be that person that walks in there it's okay to go in undecided you know it's all right to figure out where you want to be um, but go for what you want. Go for where your heart lies. Sure.
because you're going to see everybody else living your dream in your school. You can't even, you can't escape it. You show up, you in school for something you don't really want to be in, but you're going to see somebody else at your school doing what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that hurts. You're going to end up doing the wrong thing and you get lazy because that's not what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So go to school and get your education, mm -hmm. but go for what you love. That's go for your dream. And I totally agree with that. Definitely totally agree with that. So what we're going to do, um, I do, we're about to wrap up this segment, but you're going to hang out with us for a little bit, right? Oh, yeah, I'm here. So definitely, uh, we definitely have a meet and greet. So that's going to be taking place immediately right after. So everyone can get the meet and greet with you shortly after the show and take pictures. But um, how can you be reached on social media? Uh, my name is Stefan for you for everything. S-T-E-F-O-N, the number four, the letter U. Um, you type that in, whether it's my SoundCloud, my YouTube, my Twitter, my Instagram, that's the same name for everything. Stefan for you. And you want to stay on that because, I mean, like I said, the tour is real. And I'm, I'm coming, I'm ending it in Atlanta. Well, I wouldn't even say I'm ending it. We just can keep adding dates. But I'm coming to Atlanta um, May 25th at the Hard Rock. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. That's the cool. tour date for that one. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, especially, I mean, shoot, let me know if y'all from Clark. We're going we gonna to make something special for you. I might do a Clark discount for my, hey. for my, for my tickets. Hey, we cool. always look. If it's free, it's me. Yeah, we all like um, discounts, right? Yeah, let's, so let's, do, let's do no, a card discount we'll, for my tour. We'll definitely have to talk about that, that's for sure. All right, so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to jump right into, I know uh, I want to go into a segment, but I'm going to hold out on that because I'm going with, with timing on tonight. But uh, we got a couple of audience questions for the party crew, so I'm going to allow them to have their moment with you and to be able to ask any particular questions that they would like as well, all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, feel free, yeah, come on in. How you doing? What's up, Eddie? Um, so, do you think you could ever get Young Jock to come out for an interview in the future? Well, you know, I was talking about this between the break. It's very possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know about necessarily an interview as in a planned interview, but I think if we come out, you know, maybe you can bring me out for a show or something like that, you can see some surprise guests. Okay. Would y'all like that? Yeah. yeah. Like that. <laughs> so, my question is, do you think politics play a major role in the music business? Oh, yeah, it's, it's everything. Mm -hmm. It's not as much as it used to be, though, because Internet's kind of crushed a lot of politics. You got to think at one point in the industry, people used to be blackballed. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't be signed again. Mm -hmm. Now on the Internet, who cares? I mean, I don't even need a label. Like, I mean, if I'm right. popping enough and the Internet's liking me enough, I don't need a label. I'll make money without you. Right. So, yeah, it is political, very political. It's all about the check. And if anybody tells you differently, they're lying. Yep. The music does have to be there. But the check is everything, whether you throwing a DJ 20 bucks, hearing 30 bucks. And it's not even saying that you got to pay DJs like a lot of money. You got to show the DJ that you care about your music. Mm -hmm. And that's important. And that's what's important. Thank well, cool. You. All right. Thank you, party crew, for those questions. So at this time, we're going to thank you so much, Jeff. You're going to stick around with us as well, right? So at this time, we're going to take a quick break. Maybe if you'll take us out, I guess you're listening to the exclusive with Stacey Robinson on WSTU Radio. Yeah, man. DJ Chavis. My God. <laughs> cool. So, all right, welcome back to the exclusive with Stacey Robinson. I'm your host, Stacey Robinson, your host with the most exclusive and one of Atlanta's greatest ideas. All right, if you're tuning in, we have with us none other than Demetri Evans, who is a former NFL football player for the Dallas Cowboys. Demetri, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? All right, I'm doing excellent. So, Demetri is a former professional defensive end in the NFL for the Dallas Cowboys, Washington Redskins, and the San Francisco 49ers. He also was a member of the Cologne Consentinian in the NFL Europe. He played college football at the University of Georgia. Evans was signed as an undrafted free agent by the Dallas Cowboys after the 2001 NFL Draft. As a rookie, he played in all 16 games as a reserve defensive end, registering 35 tackles, one tackle for loss, one sack, five quarterback hurries, two passes defense, one forced fumble, and six special team tackles. In 2004, he was signed as a free agent by the Washington Redskins. On March 10, 2009, Evans signed in free agency a two-year, $3.8 million contract with the San Francisco 49ers to play defensive end in a 3-4 to four defense. Evans graduated in 2011 from the University of Georgia, and he is currently a consultant for the National Football League Player Association again. Mr. Evans, welcome to the exclusive. Hey, thank you for having me. Hey, we're glad to have you on the show. So, where are you from, and how did you get into football? I'm from North Louisiana, a little small town called Haynesville. 
And if you know anything about my town, it's very football rich. So growing up, you, you spent more time playing football than you actually did going to church. <laughs> gotcha. So did you always know that you would go into the NFL? Well, you know, that was my personal dream, and it was in me from day one, so I always believed in myself. And to have two cousins that was already in the NFL when I was in middle school and high school on it enhanced that dream. Gotcha. So how did you end up at the University of Georgia, and what did you major in? Well, uh, my senior year in 1997, but my last year in high school football in 1996, I had over 30 D1 scholarship football offers wow. and the recruiter for the University of Georgia was actually a Louisiana native and you know basically he kind of brainwashed my mom to not let me go to the University of Miami because of the allegation and the reputation that they had so you know he kind of won my family over and for me I just wanted to play football so I uh, felt like it was a good fit. Uh, my major was actually a business major mm -hmm. when I enrolled and was able to declare a major, but I left school early. And when I came back to the University of Georgia, my GPA wasn't high enough to stay in a business school. So I ended up getting my degree in consumer science. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And how did you get picked up by the Dallas Cowboys? Let's talk Dallas Cowboys. Now, how did that opportunity happen? Yeah, so after you declare for the NFL and you don't get drafted, they have a title called Priority Free Agents, meaning you didn't get drafted, but you still are wanted by other teams. And I had like six teams calling me. Mm -hmm. And out of the six teams that called me, my former D line coach, who coached me my first year at Georgia, was the linebacker coach for the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to be associated with someone who knew me. And it's always better to come recommended than just coming in as someone as an applicant, so to speak. So. It was just a great opportunity for me to come and a familiar uh, coaching staff with someone that I knew. Gotcha, gotcha. Wow. So what was your experience like playing for the Redskins and the 49ers? How was that experience? Playing for the Redskins actually was a great experience. You know, I grew up in a small rural town, as I mentioned, in North Louisiana. So the population was kind of like 50-50 black-white. But when I went to Washington, and it was the first time that I was in a city where the majority of people was African American. And it was just good to kind of see my people doing well, so to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, being professionals and, and really thriving. And the Redskins fan base is probably one of the, outside of Atlanta, one of the stadiums that probably 50 50, you know, black and white, a lot of black people support the Redskins to see the ticket holders in the whole nine. So, it was very refreshing, and uh, at that time, my wife came to Washington to get her residency at George Washington, so I ended up getting married, so the Redskins hold a special place in my heart during that time, and mm -hmm. going out to the West Coast, man, it was like day and night, I mean, you go from uh, East Coast to West Coast, a very liberal city, uh, anything goes, at that time, they was really pushing the whole cannabis thing, and uh, the gay pride thing was really taking off, so it was a very interesting Time, and I really learned a lot because I didn't realize how much going in the South that gave me a pre notion about people in society until I went to California. Wow. So, did you ever have to um, experience any type of racism, per se, um, since you have been in the NFL? Did you ever had any type of encounters that may have took place? No, I mean, California was one of those places where I probably felt free to basically, quote unquote, sin, so to speak, of the way I was raised and really wasn't judged for it, that makes sense, right? Right. Uh, for example, like just drinking at a beer festival in California was, was primed up on compared to if you did that in the South where we kind of grew up, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, people were just living their lives, man, and, and, and being the best version of themselves without having that Bible Belt, religion, Christianity always forced upon you. Wow, okay. So I can imagine here you are, you know, you're doing your thing, Dallas Cowboys. Um, 
Washington Redskins. We're talking about the 49ers. So how did you deal immediately with the lifestyle change? I mean, imagine going from, you know, maybe having this sort of income to now, I mean, living a whole different life. Like, how was, how was that transition for you? Well, you know, in college, I was at one of the top colleges in the country, the University of Georgia, because the SEC generates so much revenue. You know, we had a great lifestyle in college. I mean, we had apartments that we was getting stipends for. We was getting SEC checks. We was getting panel grants. We was able to sell our books back. We was getting money coming left and right. So at that time, you know, money is all relative, right? Like, in college, we had more than what we needed, so to speak. But then when you go to the NFL, not even so much the money, it's the exposure, and it's the it's the it's the lifestyle change because now everybody giving you stuff for free. Right. So then you start not valuing it until now. I'm not playing anymore, and it's very difficult for me to go to Nike and go buy some tennis shoes for a hundred bucks, a hundred fifty bucks mm -hmm. when I used to get twenty five thousand dollars worth of merchandise free from Nike a year. Mm. Wow. Right. So, so it's very hard to value something that you used to get for free, and now you got to go pay for it. Right. <laughs> I can imagine. Right. So, so I just think that was the biggest, the biggest upside for me. And of course, you know, you being able to, I was single and I didn't have any kids, mm -hmm. so I was able to kind of, you know, help my mom and uh, take my time on getting married the whole time, but. I think for me, though, it was just so much of uh, setting myself up post-career. Okay. So, University of Georgia. So, now that you this big football star, you know, you're doing your thing um, in the NFL. So, as it relates to University of Georgia, Georgia how are you, um, as a professional, able to um, benefit your alma mater? Man, that's why I really matured and kind of came into my own. Remind you, I was a 17-year-old freshman. Mm. As well as I was eight hours from home, going from Angel, Louisiana to Athens, Georgia. That's like eight and a half hours door to door. Mm. So I didn't have any family out there. I was on my own. I didn't play my high school football there, so my name wasn't known in the state. And there was a lot of hard times as far as trying to get on the field, trying to prove yourself, eating a lot of humble pie, coaching changing, position coaching changing. But, but through it all, you, you never lose who you are, right? Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. football is still football. Reading, studying, and taking tests is always the same. And you have to understand, you have to be your best version of yourself, right? Because life, I, I kind of learned that life is a do-it-yourself project, right? Mm -hmm. at, at some point, your mom and dad can only take you so far, right? right? Your coaches can only take you so far. Your boss can only teach you so much until it comes to a point where you have to kind of do a 180 and start basically putting forward the right effort to take your skill set and enhance it on your own. So that's kind of like what college is talking about. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break. Again, for those that are listening, we have former NFL player um, Demetri Evans of Dallas Cowboys, who's on the phone call with us today. And so what we're going to do is take a quick break, and we're going to return, and we're going to talk a little bit more, all right? So again, you listen to the exclusive with Stacey Robinson on WST Radio. Yeah. Welcome back to the exclusive with Stacey Robinson. I am your host, Stacey Robinson, with the most exclusive, as well as one of Atlanta's greatest ideas, we have with us former NFL player Demetrius Evans from the Dallas Cowboys. He's on call with us. Demetrius, how you doing again? I'm good, man. All right. All right. We are good. We're good. So we're going to just jump right. We're just going to dive right in. So let's talk Super Bowl. We talked about Super Bowl 2019. What was your thoughts about the Super Bowl? And also with that question, I want to ask you, have you ever played in the Super Bowl? Uh, I have not played in the Super Bowl. My thoughts regarding the Super Bowl from this year, I was kind of disappointed because I thought there was going to be a lot more scoring. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I was a defensive player, now that I am a 
fan of the game from afar and have kids, you want a little bit more action in the game and a little bit more excitement. And also, it was kind of disappointed in the halftime show, but hey, maybe next year they'll do a better job. Right? I hear you. I hear you. So, um, let me ask you this. So, what what has been your biggest fear? Has there been like a big fear of being a part of the NFL? No, I would say so. I, I never really, um, you know, at life as, as being fearful. Um, I just think it was, to me, it was just a great job. You know, people want to say it was a career, but mm-hmm. it was just a job, you know, uh, especially playing high school to college and just next transition. You know? mm-hmm. So let me ask you this. What can you say to that little boy or that college student who aspires to go into the NFL? If you can say anything that could definitely be life-changing or an eye-opener for them, what would you share? I would say to that little boy, First and foremost, believe in himself because it's going to be a time where nobody else is going to believe in you. Mm-hmm. And you have to have that sustainability. Two, I would tell the little boy to work on his craft because you have to have that muscle memory and you have to put your time in, which is most important. You have to work. Mm-hmm. It's just part of it. To that college student, I would tell that college student to be realistic he has to evaluate where he's playing college football at. He has to evaluate his skill set. He has to evaluate his IQ. He has to look at his injury history. And he also has to believe in himself as well. Because I'm not an individual who tries to rain on somebody's dream. Mm-hmm. Hey, if that's your dream and you believe in yourself, hey, it's God's living because I was that kid and couldn't nobody told me different. But I will give them some of those tangibles, just like I just mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Okay. Powerful. So what do you do in your role today as a consultant for the National Football League Players Association? So what do you do in your role? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that the NFL and the NFLPA are two separate entities, right? Mm-hmm. The NFL goes under the umbrella of the I definitely wanted to say, um, as we prepare to close out on this interview, again, I want to thank you, um, Dimitri, for being a part of this show. You, Anyone that interviews on our show, you're now what I call friends of the show, and you're also friends of my university, um, Clark Atlanta University. And again, you know, people don't, one thing my grandmother says, that, and I love to hear when she said this, that people don't have to be nice, you know? So when you hear... Um, and when you see nice people, you know, you hold on to those people and they become, you know, definitely jewels in your life. So just the thought that you would take out your time and interview and to be able to impart some wisdom to some young person or someone that's aspiring in any shape, form, or fashion what they want to do in life, to be able to hear your words definitely resonate and makes a difference. So I applaud you and want to tell you thank you. Hey, no doubt, man. We got the exclusive, exclusive, exclusive.